Hi everyone, it's Alex from Risk Academy. And I wanted to share this quick video because I, I feel uh, this template that you see in front of you is possibly the future of risk registers. It, it, it just ha has so many amazing features and it reinforces such good risk identification behavior that I, I wanted to not only share this uh, template free as part of the Risk Awareness Week, um, but also give you this a little bit of an explanation because gathering from the comments uh, online, very few people understood the significance of this template. Um, so I was working with the team in the Middle East recently and one of the projects we came up with this template, which I just feel is absolutely amazing. So this template guides you through the risk assessment process as it was meant to be in decision making. It links risk analysis to decision making. And let me just illustrate you how it does that. So first column, it's called cell reference. Um, what, what this basically means, it's the reference to the cell where the assumption is currently recorded. Now this, I mean, if this doesn't blow your mind, um, then uh, you know, pre prepare for something amazing. Because first, I mean, this is, you know, this is groundbreaking stuff. I mean, for anyone who's in decision science or uh, has been doing decision making for ages, this is not new at all. I mean, if you're working for CIA, this is how you've been doing this risk analysis uh, for years. But for, for the rest of us, for, for your average risk manager, uh, this is groundbreaking because just you know, pay attention to this very carefully. Risk identification starts not with the checklist, not with your categories of risk, not with your strategic operational financial and reporting or some other you know, nonsense that uh, a you know, international best practice guidance came up with. Risk identification starts with identifying all the assumptions that are relevant to a particular decision. So before, I, I mean, this is just so groundbreaking. Before you can even begin to think about risk identification, you have to understand decision at hand. You have to break down that decision. You have to find the model, the financial model usually, or a project schedule, or uh, some sort of other representation or calculation where that decision has been scoped or measured or uh, evaluated. So this is, you know, this is uh, groundbreaking stuff. Before you can even begin, I mean, we haven't even mentioned the word risk yet. Before you even begin to think about risks, you first have to understand the decision, break it down and drill down to each assumption. And then you list out all the assumptions. So this is what first column is all about. It's listing out all the assumptions that are significant for a particular decision. Now, this is actually much more difficult than it seems because you, you, know, you may potentially need to run like a quick sensitivity analysis to determine which assumptions do or do not impact on the decision. I mean, traditionally um, in an Excel file where or you know, any other software that, where the decision is actually calculated, there, there are assumptions that are kind of listed as assumptions. Sometimes they're color coded differently. Sometimes they are actually put on a separate tab in an Excel file, which is called assumptions. The reality, however, is most of the time, times those assumptions are spread out throughout the Excel spreadsheet. Some of them color coded, some of them are not color coded. Um, even the assumptions that are, are color coded may in fact have no impact on the actual decision at hand. So it's, it's a big question to figure out which assumptions do impact, which assumptions are significant, and which assumptions are there, but somehow ignored from the whole calculation. And you have to ask the question, well, why is that the case? Why did somebody switch them off from the decision making? Was that a conscious choice or was that just uh, you know, negligence or, or some other, uh, other reason? So first cell, find all the assumptions that actually impact on the decision. I mean, already 
for most of the risk managers, this is something that you have never done before because you always traditionally start risk identification with your little checklist saying, here are my categories of risks. Here are the common risks that I need to ask. Can you go for an interview? Well, you know, let me reinforce this again. This is, this is what I'm saying. This is groundbreaking stuff. Forget about the interviews. You, you're way before the interviews happen. You, you have to understand the actual decision at hand and you have to understand it well enough to understand all the assumptions. For that, you yet to meet anyone. This is all homework. Homework that risk managers are failing to do traditionally. Don't be a statistic. You have to change your approach to risk management. Next column is assumption name. So that's just basically listing out what's in that cell reference. Whatever the assumption is, you know, it could be foreign exchange rate, it could be interest rate, it could be local interest rate, it could be USD interest rate, it could be market growth, it could be change in the price, it could be price itself, it could be number of staff, it could be overhead costs, it could be the cost of equipment, it could be loan amount. Now, all of those are typical assumptions that you would have in, uh, in the decision model or literally anything else. And you list out all the assumptions. And then the next column, the third column, is all about understanding what's the current value. Just to keep track and make sure the history kind of is maintained, you have to uh, document uh, what's the default value, what's the value out there. And then the next column, this is where the fun starts. This is when you start identifying risks. This is where you have your little checklists to make sure you haven't forgotten any risk. This is where you look at due diligences, external reports, uh, third party information. You look at statistics, you look at incident data, um, you look at market uh, forecasts. You, you look at anything you can find that is relatively, relatively subjective. And if you don't have that information, then you talk with experts. You calibrate them first and then you talk with them. But the, the idea is that you're trying to identify the risks relevant to each assumption. Again, this is the second step where um, you know, the whole traditional risk management approach becomes um, completely explodes because this is not how we do. We traditionally identify risks for the sake of identifying risks. As in, we have a list of risks. Well, the list of risks is meaningless unless it's actually mapped out against each of the assumptions that is influencing the decision. So every single step we do, we're always trying to bring it back to the decision at hand because that's the only reason to do risk analysis unless it's a regulatory requirement. The only reason to do risk analysis is to influence and to in, in, inform the decision at hand. And that's why you, you know, you, we would have a different risk analysis for every decision type. So fourth column, that's when we actually identify risks. And depending on how many risks we have identified, depending on how significant those risks are, we now have grounds to start replacing default values, which were usually single point estimates, with ranges. And that's the whole idea of risk analysis. And again, this is groundbreaking stuff for most risk managers, because traditionally risk managers look at each risk individually without linking it to any assumption whatsoever. And then they rank each risk in terms of likelihood and consequence. Well, I mean, this is absolutely, I mean, not only it's mathematically stupid to do that, it's actually not really helpful because you have to link the whole risk analysis information back to the assumptions, back to the decision. The whole reason why we do risk analysis is to inform our decision making. So here we use the risk information to propose an initial range for each of the assumption. And this is the time when we run the initial simulation you know using monte carlo or whatever other technique um, you prefer um, we run the simulation and we actually get because we have all our inputs as ranges we now have all our outputs our decision criteria as ranges as well we have them as a probability distribution so now 
we can tell whether the um, decision is a good one. We can tell whether the decision, what's the likelihood of uh, achieving or exceeding that decision. We can tell based on the Tornado diagram, what are some of the assumptions of hence risks that have the biggest influence and hence need to be mitigated and so on. It's already giving us a lot of ammunition to improve the kind of the decision-making, but that's not it. The next column is very important, obviously. We now have another dialogue with the decision-makers, with the key stakeholders, trying to identify what are the proposed mitigations. What are some of the mitigations that they are considering as part of making this decision? What do they have in mind to mitigate the risks and hence reduce the uncertainty, reduce the ranges, because that's essentially what we're trying to do during risk analysis. We're trying to seek additional information, take steps to reduce uncertainty associated with the decision. So once we have mapped out all our mitigations against the risks, against the assumptions, against the decision, we now come up with an updated range, which is usually like a smaller uh, it may be smaller, it may not be smaller because we have not proven that we have enough information to um, reduce the range. Um, we may come to a conclusion that we have no information on a particular risk and uh, we may have to exclude, but have to be very transparent about what we're excluding from our risk analysis. Um, but basically what we're trying to, what we're aiming to do is we're aiming to reduce uncertainty on each of the assumptions based on the mitigations that we mapped against the risks, that we mapped against assumptions, that we mapped against the decision. And then we rerun the simulation. And now we have one simulation, which is current, uh, current uh, you, you know, your, our initial uh, you know, risk exposure. And then the second one is our kind of updated risk exposure. And that's the updated risk exposure that we want management and the decision makers to see and use for the actual decision making. So most of the, I mean, most of the work here happens in the background with the actual team that prepared that decision. But then the final version finally gets to the decision makers because we're saying we've tried to reduce this uh, uncertainty as much as possible. This is how much uncertainty is left. Uh, it's probably impossible to reduce uncertainty to zero. Um, so this is the kind of risks that you need to acknowledge and take in order to make this decision. Are you comfortable with that? And then if the decision makers are comfortable, then that's kind of risk analysis done. Then it moves into monitoring and, and implementation and so on. Uh, but the decision makers may say, no, I'm not comfortable making that decision. I still need more information. So you go back, you investigate, you maybe get a budget to investigate uh, additional mitigations. And then you rerun the simulation the third time based on all the additional analysis work carried out uh, by the risk team and the, the team that was preparing the decision making. And that's how you keep information about risks. Um, this is an amazing template. I wish one day we started using this instead of the traditional risk registers that we currently have, because this drives proper behavior of linking um, uh, on first investigating assumptions, second linking risks to the assumptions, third linking mitigations to the assumptions and the risks, and then running simulations. And, and this, this risk register, this template is actually built on two techniques. Uh, one is called key assumptions check, and it's a tool extensively used by CIA analysts. Uh, it has been used for years. You know, it's a pretty good tool. If it's good enough for them, it's probably good enough for us in risk management. And it kind of forces you slowly along your journey to start using proper mathematical tools like simulations to show the effect of uncertainty on objectives and decisions. And that's a wonderful uh, behavior. It's a win-win, simple table, easy to understand for all the decision makers, yet, yet it reinforces very valuable behavior, including simulation, which is you know, running simulation using Monte Carlo, for, for example. A wonderful approach. I hope you give it a try. I hope you um, enjoy this template. And if you have any feedback, by all means, do share.